This podcast is a project of the Medina Focus, with the goal of providing space for collaboration and community among practitioners to the Muslim diaspora in North America. As people around the world have immigrated to the West, many Christians have realized that they live and work in the midst of the nations, and they often feel alone and unprepared to communicate cross-culturally. If you're looking for conversation and community surrounding issues of loving Muslim friends in Jesus' name, we welcome you into the conversation. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Medina Focus podcast. This is our next season of production of the show. We're so glad that you're still listening uh, and still uh, staying with us. I know it's been a long time, and uh, you know COVID's kind of thrown us for throws thrown us a little bit of a curveball. Um, but I'm really excited to getting back to helping you share your stories with uh, the Medina Focus Network. And I have a little bit of a surprise for you today. Hey, everybody. It's me, Nate. Nate's here. Hey, we have got Nate with us in the studio. So, uh, you know, Nate and I often work remotely <clears throat> with him away on one side of the country and me way on the other side of the country. But uh, he just happens to be in Houston. We're together. Yeah, together. Um, so really excited about that. So, Nate, today we're talking about... um this whole idea of what is the global impact of diaspora ministry. And I know this is something yeah. you feel strongly about, right? Yeah, I think, I think it's, I don't know, to me it seems really intuitive that, that they're connected, that the world is a small place and uh, people are interrelated here in, in uh, the diaspora where they're around our neighborhoods and they're still connected over in their home countries. And I, I see, just see those connections. And other people can't see them for some reason. Yeah. And I think we, you and I are also at an interesting time and place in the history of the development of diaspora ministry and that we're, we're, we happen to be uh, here at the front end of it. And at the same time, we, you know, you and I through uh, the network and such, we, we talk with and consult with agencies that are at all ends of the spectrum hmm. um, of where are they in their understanding or awareness, or appreciation, or lack thereof. Um, and so we see this again and again where these questions are kind of thrown out of, yeah, but isn't this a distraction? Or, hmm. And I would say even at the church level, you know, or the local level, a lot of practitioners realize this when they go and talk to churches, you know, the church might have the attitude of, yeah, so what? I mean, why don't they just come here? Like, they, isn't the answer just for them to come here to this church? Hmm. Um, and so there's this kind of, yeah, but, but why is this important? And so it seems like it's it's even it's like both for churches and for sending agencies, they have a a very strict picture of what the field is. Yeah, and what what is that picture? So, for sending agencies, the field is overseas. It's in the the home countries, and uh, for churches, I think the field is inside their buildings, people that that have come in. Uh, but yeah, so that this, it's a, it's a paradigm shift for both. I think to to think in terms of going out to in North America to engage the diaspora, um, it's a different way of thinking. Yeah. So today on our show, we are bringing in two other guests and they're going to share some pretty awesome stories, uh, with us today. We have, uh, two folks in different parts of the country. We're going to be joined with uh, Susan, and she's the director of the, inter the, the N, that's an acronym for International Neighborhood Network, and they have multiple sites uh, along the East Coast. And we're also joined today by Josh, who is a church planter in Memphis, Tennessee. So Susan and Josh, thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. So... You and I and, and Nate, we've had these really fun uh, side conversations uh, in various meetings, and, and we've heard stories from each other, and, and you know, we all have some connection to diaspora ministry, and we see the global impact that it has. And I feel like not everybody sees that. And so one of the first things I, I want us to talk about is I want to let everyone else in on our kind of internal conversation that we've had. And so we've kind of created this fishbowl 
and we've had a great time, but now it's time to sort of pull the pull the shade off and, and let others see this as well. And so my my question, let me just set it up this way. There's you know, there's people in the missions world who are doing mobilization um, who don't maybe understand what is the global impact that diaspora missions or reaching out to diaspora groups has on global missions. Um, there maybe there's a disconnect in their mind, or they just it is a relatively new thing, and so there's not a ton of stories out there. Uh, even even though there are lots of workers in local contexts, sometimes even the local workers don't understand that their ministry is having a global impact. So imagine for a moment, you're sitting with someone, and their question kind of is like, "Well, well, so what? Uh, what would be a story that you would share with them that would demonstrate the global impact of diaspora outreach?" Hey, it's great to be with y'all again. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I I really just saw the the vision behind diaspora ministries honestly when we we came back from being overseas unexpectedly in 2018 uh our calling had not changed in the least our vision our direction it was exactly the same um the problem was our sending organization just didn't have a paradigm for that it was basically i could work in mobilization um which which wasn't my passion wasn't my calling or i could <clears throat> I could find a new country to move to, which in our family rhythm just wasn't able to work at that. So I was left with this like burden for unreached people groups, but burden for Muslim people, and and yet like no tangible means to walk it out. And I'm really grateful for the grace of God. Um, I was in a position of leadership in my local church, and they had me leading a prayer trip to uh, Marseille, France. And on this trip. I kind of just went expecting to, to just let the Holy Spirit direct our steps and just allow rhythms of prayer and abiding to just kind of direct us to people of peace, people who, who God was already working in our lives. And it just so happened um, we were serving at a yard sale in this apartment complex that was really um, infamous for just mobs, uh, just just mafia, drugs, and the refugee populations that all kind of get lumped in there. Um, if you're familiar with France, that's kind of how things work a lot of times. And, and met a man at a yard sale, and he was literally just looking for a pair of shorts. And, and he started speaking to me in French. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't speak much French. Do you speak Arabic? And he said, of course I speak Arabic. I'm from Tunis. And I said, oh, that's great. You know, like, my, my family and I lived in North Africa. Like, there's my wife, and she speaks Arabic just like I do. <laughs> And he said, no, and, and he looks over at her and he says, Madame, what do you think of Marseille? And she said, oh, it's fine, but I like, I like North Africa better. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he laughed and he said, okay, I got to get you coffee now. And so we were kind of thinking like, okay, look, person of peace, like somebody who receives you with joy, somebody who said something before you. And so he, he does, he brings us coffee and he, we have conversation, and as we have conversation, he tells us he's got four daughters, and, and one of them lives in Texas, and, and the worker that we're partnering with on the ground is, is from Texas and going back to Texas the next month. So he said, well, I've got to get her number. I'd love to connect with her sometime, and um, they're from the same country in North Africa as we've been serving in, and it was just a joy for us to, to meet somebody there. And he says, well, look, let's call her right now. And we say, no, it's 3 a.m., like, let, let her sleep, and he says, no, I insist. I'm her father. I can do what I want. <laughs> and so he laughs, and, and he calls her, and she wakes up kind of in a stupor at three and says, Dad, are you, are you okay? What's wrong? He says, here, make, meet my American friends. And <laughs> hands the phone over to the worker, and he says, hi, how are you? So sorry it's so early. Your dad really wanted to call you. And said, it's okay. Like, what are you doing there? Like, why are you in this neighborhood? And, <laughs> right. And um she was like, is it, is it for work or is it for ministry? And he said, well, I'm with a church. And at that, she just stopped and said, hey, can you go somewhere where my dad can't hear you? Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that she had become a believer four years previous through dreams and visions. Um, she had fallen asleep that night praying and fasting for her dad's salvation. Wow. And, like, it just so happened that we got to be an answer to that prayer. And so we kind of like excitedly told her how much joy we had hearing that she knew Jesus and just said, hey, pray for us. We're, we're going to keep hanging out with your dad until he kicks us out. And um, he invites us up to his home and he shows us every inch of it. I mean, just this is this is where I do my sewing. This is where I do my cross stitching. This is where I make my potatoes. Uh, this is where I go to the bathroom. I mean, just literally <laughs> everything. And, <laughs> 
and and we kind of we, we just talked to them and say, hey, this is a gift from God to meet you and meet your daughter, and we'd love to pray with you. We're here to pray. We're here to bless the city of Marseille through prayer. And so can we pray? And so we pray in Arabic, and I'm ready to say goodbye. And, and my wife just felt a nudge from the Holy Spirit and looked me in the eye and said, God is seeing your heart. He knows the kindness that's in your heart, but he also knows the shame that you carry. This is your time. You know this is true. God sent us here to tell you about the life that you have in Jesus available to you. The shame that you carry in your heart, he put to death when he died on the cross. And the new life that he lives, he's offering today. You know this is true. This is your time. And and she was doing this in Arabic, which was way above her pay grade. (laughs) And he just jumped up and received us with joy and had tears in his eyes and hugged us and, and said, you're my daughter now. Like, you don't ever stay in a hotel again. Like, my daughter is your sister. And, and he didn't know just how true that phrase was, that, that his daughter was our sister in Christ. And so we were blown away. Well, fast forward a few weeks, we, we actually spent a little longer time there than the rest of our team because we went to Tunis for a few days. And we came back, and it just so happened that our flight was routed through Dallas, Texas. Well, that's where the girl was from. It just so happened that she worked as a flight attendant, and she was just happening to work in the lounge at Cutter Airways that that day and it just so happened that our gate that we came through security at was D twenty two and she was working at D twenty one. So it was just this big Whoa, blessing to away. that coming back we get to meet this girl. She shares a testimony with our church that blesses our church, that blesses the church in Marseille, that blesses the workers there. And it was this cascade of blessings that we couldn't have possibly imagined or couldn't have possibly dreamed. And here's this man who's from hard background and supposed to be hard ground that's impossible to reach Mm -hmm. she said look he doesn't have american friends he doesn't have friends he doesn't invite anybody into his house he hates americans and he hates christians are you sure this is my dad (laughs) (laughs) and and we we kind of laughed and said yeah and and we told him what we'd shared and told her what we'd shared and she said what did he say he said this is truth this is truth and she was just blown away and she said look i had a vision right after I came to Christ of an American couple sharing the gospel with my dad in his apartment. Whoa. And I laughed because I thought this is impossible for God. This is mm. too hard to do that. This could never happen. Um, and, and literally like God fulfilled that promise in us. And there was no set of circumstances in our life that would have led us to Marseille in that moment, mm-hmm. other than exactly what we'd gone through or equipped us for Marseille in that moment, other than exactly what we'd gone through. And so, I think it really gave us a fresh vision and, and wind in our sails to see, like, hey, there's a need for diaspora ministry in a powerful way. And, like, just because you're not in a context that's majority context doesn't mean that there's not incredible fruit to be had. So that was that was kind of our story. Wow. Uh, I feel like I should have told my story first so I don't have to follow that. So I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna throw Susan under the bus. Susan, uh, w- what's the story you would share? Thanks, Brian. Um my husband and I have served with World Team for many years, and we uh, I was in a, a global leadership position, and our headquarters is right outside of Paris, France, and so we were living in and out of Paris area, and one day, this is going to sound like I'm copying Josh, but we met in a little patisserie, uh, a Muslim couple, uh, and we just started into conversation, very casual, uh, and one thing led to another, and for weeks, uh, we spent many hours uh, drinking coffee and eating the most delicious pastries in the world with this couple. And it was soon after that that we had to return to the United States uh, for a family health reason. And we kept in contact with this couple. Uh, we're still in contact many years later with this couple. I wish I could say they had come to faith. Mm. I love your story, Josh. Uh, our couple has not. But it opened our eyes when we came back to the United States as to what was God doing here with all the people uh, that he was bringing to America. And so we started doing all kinds of research. And a few years later, uh, God allowed us to open a new ministry called the International Neighborhood Network right here in the United States. And, you know, honestly, being somewhat of a novice uh, in this area, uh, we had a lot to learn. And we started surrounding ourselves with people who knew a lot more than we did. And we were on just a rapid learning curve. 
And that was just four years ago. And in that time, God has brought us 28 workers. We're in seven cities and growing as fast as we can. And so, you know, we just praise God for something we did not see as part of our ministry. Uh, but God introduced us to it through this lovely Tunisian couple uh, living and serve, or not serving, but living in, in, in the Paris area. So we look at that as God connecting dots that we could never have connected. Wow. I love that strategy of like how it's not, it's not us copying. It's literally just the way the Holy Spirit works. And I think just, right. I love your openness to just see God use that to equip you and launch people out. Yeah. So uh, for my story, uh, listeners, you might want to pause the podcast and roll out a map because this has two different <laughs> triangles of, of uh, direction that, that peoples and stories are going. And, and so I'll try to make it as clear as I can. Uh, but you can start with myself. I, I live and work here in Houston. Um, I have a, a small team that's met in my living room for years now. Uh, and one of, you know, our team is multifaceted. We don't do have a team project per se. Each person on the team has something that they do. And then we're kind of the centralized support equipping, uh, you know, prayer group for that. So one of our guys, um, he works in Athens with refugees. And he... Uh, comes back to our prayer meeting one night, and he says, Hey, guys, there's, there's this Pakistani guy that I met several years ago. I led him to the Lord. Uh, he's a believer, and his son is headed to Panama City. And, uh, you know, he's, he's fleeing persecution. There's, there's some hit out on the family because of, you know, the family's growing Christianity. And so, man, if only we could help him in Panama City. And I thought, well... Man, I don't know anybody in Panama City, Florida. I'm, I'm assuming the American context, and I kind of said, "Well, if it was Panama City, Panama, I actually know someone there." And he goes, "No, it's it, Panama." And so the 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 flip side of this story is, uh, you know, Nate and myself, and you know, thousands of others around the world gathered in Thailand a few years ago, and uh, this was for the Abide Bear Fruit Conference, and I met uh, a gentleman named Gustavo who is served in North Africa, uh, knows the, the language, knows the culture, and he's back in his home country of Panama. And he is there, has a, has a very similar ministry, I think, to mine in Houston, or Susan, to yours as well. I, I think in terms of, you know, he's reaching out to the, the refugees and the immigrants there. And there are tons that are coming into Panama right now. And so uh, I had met him, and we've stayed in contact. We've done some projects together over the years. So you know, you've, you've got me going to Thailand, meeting a guy from Panama, and then you have Bobby from Houston also going to Athens, meeting a guy from Pakistan, and then God just brought both of these very random triangles of direction and overlaid them uh, through this story. And so uh, Aftab has a son, Bobby tells me about it, and in the meeting I go, well, let me just text my friend Gustavo and see see what he's up to these days. And so, you know, I pull out WhatsApp and, hey, Gustavo, brother, how's it going? Praying for your ministry. Thought of you tonight because we've got a, a Pakistani refugee guy that's headed into Panama City. And within, you know, minutes, I have a response from him. Uh, he's mobilizing his team to go out and find, it's not just this guy, it's this guy and about, uh, I think, five or six other friends. And uh, they are finding this group and uh, they brought them some Bibles and I mean they were helping them learn how to integrate into Panama and so on day it wasn't day one but shortly after they arrived uh, they're still on their you know two-week tourist visa by the time Gustavo uh, picks up this group of friends and is able to start uh, ministering uh, ministering to them have you heard the, the latest about Gustavo I have not yeah, so when when COVID uh, started, um, the uh, uh, Panamanian government didn't want anything to do with the refugees because they were too interested in in dealing with their own people. Uh, the, the the issues with COVID, uh, you know, among their own population. So they they were trying to find people who would care for the refugees, and and uh, Gustavo wound up being one of those people. Whoa! And uh, so he was going into the, the camps that were really blockaded off and wound up uh, having people requesting Bibles 
from him from all different nations. So he, he's been like on the lookout for how to get Bibles down to Panama that he can give out to these refugees. And they, they said they don't want digit they don't want um like streaming bibles they don't want apps because they don't have enough internet to get it so they actually mm. want the physical bibles they're asking <laughs> so he's like on the lookout to try and find urdu and, and all these different kinds of languages for the bible he's really doing well down there wow so all right i'm sitting with three experts right here right now and you've heard three different stories and I, and I know that we're each connected to probably a bunch of other stories that we could share all day um so as you're as you're hearing these i mean what are the opportunities i mean what what are the ways that we can coordinate what's happening here with what's happening all of the places over there because i mean I, I agree with josh this is kind of a holy spirit thing of god is leading us to places and it's just these kind of divine appointments. Um, but maybe that also teaches us, hey, there's an open door that God is just wanting us all to join hands and walk through. So what do you think the the opportunities are to coordinate uh, these kind of efforts? I think that's been something I've really had just on my heart is to see a cohesive strategy together so that this becomes more of an like actual way of, of thinking about working among the diaspora here, but it's not just a one-off type thing, but it's a, it's a full on like strategy of organizations because there's so few people tangibly doing it. Even in my city, I, I was thinking about Memphis and I mean, we have a huge Somali population. We have a big Mauritanian population, Afghans, Pakistanis. You know, I mean, literally like some of the hardest places to go and live in the world. And they're all scattered here in our city, but there's there's maybe a handful of people um, in the entire city of, of over around, right around a million people who are targeting these groups. Um, and so I think that's that's one of the questions that I've still got is like, how do we cohesively strategize for this? Because the church isn't quite um, ready on, on a missiological framework mm -hmm. to, to just jump right in on day one. They need people like Nate. They need people like Brian. They, they need people like Susan to kind of help steer their efforts to helpful directions. Um, yeah. When uh, we were beginning to launch the inn, I had a lot of conversations with Nate. And one of the, my huge takeaways was don't do this in isolation. Don't minister to mm -hmm. unreached diaspora in, in isolation. And that was one of the best pieces of advice I could have gotten. And it actually is where our name came from, the International Neighborhood Network. So if we're going into a city, we're going to network with who is whoever's there that wants to network with us. And it's been amazing. Uh, the churches, individuals, businesses that are excited to be part of something. Uh, and we also network with things that are already there that we don't have to replicate. But it's interesting because every city we go in, we find Lone Rangers. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's a missed opportunity uh, for us you know, for us all to work together as the church uh, to reach the communities that we're serving. So, you know, Josh, I love to hear a pastor who's saying, hey, this is how it should be. And we have found uh, churches and individuals, businesses that are, are willing are willing to do it. And most of the time, after you help them learn how to do it. And I think that's the other piece. Um, I think people are willing, maybe they don't know how, and so that's part of what we do in our network. Hey, Susan, when, when you uh, have your you know, people doing ministry among the diaspora, do you find that they ever, do you ever experience where uh, people will get invitations to go to weddings or, or you know, events that back in the home countries of where people are? Josh, do you have that to happen too? Yeah, that happens uh, on a regular basis. Is that interesting? Yeah, I think basically every time we're interacting with the diaspora, it's like, hey, you need to come to my place. Mm -hmm. I need to show you how it's done, where I'm from. And it is really a fun thing, too, because it's like, I mean, we've kind of welcomed them into our place, and we're really happy. That's one of the things we say. I'm so happy that, that God brought you to Memphis. Like, I'm so happy that you're here. I'm so happy you're in my city and you get to know this. But there's this reciprocity that the honor shame culture especially wants to have of hospitality and so yeah there, there's so many invitations to walk in life with these people um, they're I've just heard, waiting for people yeah I've, I've heard so many people that 
when they get that kind of invitation, they just, their eyes get wide and they, they go, Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. And they, they don't ever even consider taking them Mm -hmm. up on it. Right. It's like, there's no, uh, Oh, I couldn't do that, but uh, that sounds too, way too risky, but I just want to encourage people. I mean, that, that is, that would be an, an amazing way to cross the, the ocean and and get opportunities like that. I actually think it it would be a a good way for networking between sending agencies that have people mm-hmm. in those locations overseas. Right. If we could somehow link those connections, right? When when we know that we're heading over, we can find out from the the agencies or the people that we know that are over there and start to make those connections. What would it be like if uh, your friend in Marseille could um, connect back to his home country with people. Connect you, you know, his daughter, you know, your your wife, his daughter, with uh, friends back at home. Yeah, it'd be amazing. Well, Nate, you know, you know that that's how it works too, right? Like relational networks are so key in in the diaspora portion of the world, and like just knowing one person is a gate opener for for so many relationships. I mean, we. I was able to go um, into Pakistan because of some sports work I was doing, and, and I got an invitation from from a leader there. And yeah. and literally, my invitation there was approved. My visa was granted quickly, and and I had like literally the whole country laid open to me because of the relationship that preceded me. Yeah. And I think a lot of times we'd rather just go and say, well, it's really hard to build relationships here, but like. The people are here. I think that's a huge missed mm-hmm. piece of strategy right now, um, in in the kind of missiological world. That, that like the relationships are here, so let's build them. Let's let's steward them well. And and I think if we go one level up, like we're thinking, you know, on the ground strategy. But if we go one level up and think of it in terms of systems, um, I actually live in three worlds. I live in the missions world. I'm also a pastor at a church. Uh, in the international district here, and I also teach at a Christian university here in Houston. And so I I hear in each of those, you know, conversations, there's this, uh, there's this moment of hand wringing at any meeting there of, oh, we, we wish that we had better connections with the church, or the church would say, well, we wish we had better connections with the mission agency or with the, you know, Christian education. And everyone is saying, oh, we wish this were here. And, and in my mind, Partnership through diaspora ministry is the the missing piece, but also the piece that networks all of those three institutions together. Um, and I honestly, like the the church is one of the missing elements of this. Where historically, it's give us your best people, and we've got it from here. Um, and, and, and I mean that's the school attitude as well. Hey, you know, you want to train a pastor? All right, send them to us, and we will train them in all of these things. And it it removes the church from that. But I think from the mission agency and the strategizing side, you're dealing with limited resources. And so how do you, how do you go, well, we're trying to engage in, in Somalia, and I've got these 50 opportunities across the West where there's all of these other cities uh, that I can uh, you know, start spreading our already thin resources through. You know, how, do, how do we make this decision? But if we could mobilize the church— um, it seems like that's a missing piece of the workforce and fixes these other kind of missed connections. So let's let's talk maybe about mobilizing the church. You know, Josh, you and I are both uh, ch- church guys, and Susan, I'm I'm sure you work with a lot of uh, churches, and so and we've had other guests on the show. Uh, Ryan shared uh, Ryan Pennington up in Amarillo shared a while back about this kind of dual challenge of uh, you know he has a heart to work with and disciple the local church. At the same time, you know, he's in a very traditional country town with, on the flip side, you have this very weird juxtaposition of Somali. And so, you know, there, there's, obvious, uh, there's obvious a danger level for him of, you know, he's creating all these openings, and then if he brings the wrong person through that door, uh, what will happen? And so, just practically, from either either of your sides, would you help us... Maybe think of like what are you know two or three things that churches need to be thinking about as they're looking to partner uh, in diaspora ministry and with this kind of global impact. Yeah, like what what might how how might they be prepared to yeah 
to think in terms that I, I think a lot of times churches they're thinking in terms of hey, I'm just going to do this local ministry because these people are in need in my community and they've got a diaspora community next to them but they don't have any concept that it could that it could expand and be global and so how could how could we prepare people in advance to think in that mindset of what what will we do when this gives us global scope we 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 talk in terms of a triangle and we, in the, the corners of the triangle are the church the agency and the focus ministry and so if we have gatekeepers in that ministry maybe people even who have not yet come to faith in christ it's advantageous that the agency uh leaders local and the local church and these gatekeepers are talking together and when you were just talking brian about being invited uh, to to go to a different country, sometimes the resources are limited, but whenever possible, the church, the agency, workers, and the gatekeepers go together. And we've had several trips to the Middle East uh, that have been church, gatekeepers, and agency. We're planning one for this fall where I will be in the Middle East again. And I really think that changes things because you're experiencing this together. Uh, it's not you know, the agency telling the church or the church mm -hmm. telling the agency or the gatekeeper feeling like they've been left out. These are their family. These are their people. Uh, and I, it's, it's a small thing. It can't happen every day, but it changes things for the longer term. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So, so Josh, you've been both on the field, uh, a pastor, and you're working somewhat with diaspora. So what would your kind of tips to pastors and churches be in this regard? Yeah, I think I'd just start saying like, hey, this is, I'm wrestling with these issues right now as a lead pastor. like, how do I transmit this DNA, right? Like, I think in so many churches, um, sometimes the pastor's theology of missions is is a limiting factor, mm -hmm. right? That the, the pastors aren't really fired up about overseas. They kind of see the local needs and want to prioritize those because they're urgent, which is, that's fair, right? Like, it's fair to look to the poor and the needy in our towns, Um I think that that's also something that we have to look at the diaspora that's in our towns too, if we want to start with proximity. Um, Who are I often poor and needy. Like, exactly, right? And I think like, I think for me, it's such a tangible way to show Jesus. Because like, why in the world would you show up to meet my needs? Like, why in the world mm -hmm. would you come from a different place to come and meet me? Uh, I think I think we have to start with the belief in the church, really. Um, I think a lot of my friends on the ground in the field overseas had negative views of the church in, in some sense. Like it was like kind of discouraging. Mm -hmm. I talked to these workers and they're like, I was like, how's your local context? And they're like, well, you know, they don't get in the way too much. And I was like, that's the best we can say about the, the bride of Christ. Like we have to believe in the church because like it's God's plan, right? Like that's the starting place. And I think we have to believe in the church to assume her long-term mission in her long-term vision, we have to see her kind of step up to the plate and, and take on more of the mission of Jesus, not less. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm, I'm a 10,000-foot view person, so I can get really theoretical, but I think just practically, like, putting stress on our, our churches to, like, put ourselves in proximity to neediness, I, I think that's a really great starting point, is just saying, like, hey, who are you walking with who doesn't look like you, doesn't talk like you, doesn't vote like you? You know, doesn't doesn't come from the same background, and really prizing diversity, and, and really the stress that that puts on your assumptions, the stress that that puts on your theology, your your interpretation of scripture. I think we've probably in the American church had a apathy towards diversity for a long time, and I think that's a really huge opportunity for us to kind of see that activate in the church. It, it's part of the DNA of the church. It's just like, hey, we need to activate this portion of our DNA. It'd be like if a bird didn't know it to fly, right? Like, you'd see it hopping around on the ground and like, come oh, on, you, you made for a lot more than this. And I think as a pastor, I think um, I think partnership is another huge part of that piece where we have the humility to walk together with people who don't agree with us on every bit of theology, who don't agree with us on every bit of theopraxy but that we can humble ourselves and kind of really unite and, and be that bridge. Like you were talking about, Brian, of just like, do you need somebody to bridge that gap? I wish we had this. I wish we had that. Right. And I think like 
best part of my calling is to be a bridge of peace communities that look different from each other that wouldn't otherwise interact and kind of see relationships catalyzed in that way. Yeah, it's a. Uh, you mentioned you know pastors' theology of mission being a limited factor. I think also our theology of church can be a limiting factor where we think of the primary function of outreach is to grow my ch- this church. And I understand, yeah. you know, people have needs, especially coming out of COVID, you know, where church numbers are down and this impacts giving, which is going to have a trickle down effect to how many dollars are being sent to mission agencies, right? So there's this yeah, vicious people are circle. In survive mode, right? right. And yet, um, if I'm always thinking, how do I get people to come to my church? I might see them as individuals and as opportunities uh, just for them and me. And, you know, I live in the international district. Our church is 50 nations and probably our community is 150. And yet, in my mind, I think, well, if, <laughs> if, if, if we have a kingdom, a God's kingdom mentality as a church, instead of thinking through how do we just get this person into our pew, we're now thinking how does this person want to, you know, how does God want this person to be a channel and an open door, a conduit between us and some place we never imagined that God would be using us? And that's challenging. <laughs> it's exhausting at times, but it's also really amazing, you know, to hear, uh, you know, Susan and Josh to hear your stories and just think through other stuff that that I've that I've heard as well. Um, but honestly, at the you know the same problem that the mission agency leader is dealing with of how do I send people to Pakistan and deal with Pakistani communities all throughout the world? I have to pick. the The pastors are in the same boat of. We're in survival mode. You're asking us for people. Okay, now it's for money. Now it's for this. Now it's, you know, you know, and, and the flip side is, you know, we get bombarded with requests for every kind of ministry uh, that are, are valid and valuable things, and it's hard to sometimes go, well, wait, here's kind of God's global picture that, that at least our church is deciding that we're going to follow. So, yeah, I think all of these things can be really, uh, really challenging. I think that stewardship of, of people, though, is such an important thing, Brian, like that, that you're talking about, like, how do we steward this one person that, that we see represented in our midst right now mm-hmm. that could be a conduit to thousands, if not millions of people in another community that I'll never have a network to, I'll never have access to. And just kind of the book of Acts really challenged me on this a, a few years ago that was like, look how much God does in communities, mm-hmm. right? but through individual people like Paul, you know, Peter sent to Cornelius, like one guy, you know, like uh, Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch, right? Like that's one person and God like blesses an entire community through this one individual story. Um, look at Saul, how he's like the, the center, you know, Paul, like the center of, of a huge portion of the church, like Stephen. I mean, just all these individuals that God does transcendent, unbelievably more than we could ever imagine things with. And I think, we have to be willing to just wonder and say, like, okay, Lord, like, what could you do with this relationship mm-hmm. and treat those relationships like they matter rather than, I think the tyranny, the urgent really weighs us down because we get a million priorities and they're all super busy and super meaningful. Um, but, but it's a stewardship issue. That's a really good point. I like the, that if you've got the one person, um, it might not be that you get the invitation to go over, um, you've got one friend in the diaspora community that you're reaching out to, but it could be, well, how, how, how do I know that that could actually do anything global? Like S- Susan, do you have diaspora friends that, that have connection? I think we, it's, it's easy for us to think, okay, people that come here, um, they, they're cut off from their homeland and now they're, now they're in America, they're going to, you know, settle in and they're going to not have those connections anymore. Have you seen ways that, what, what are the ways that your diaspora friends are still connecting to their families or people back in the homelands? You know, they are definitely connected back to their homeland and on a very regular basis. Um, if you're familiar with discovery Bible studies and at the end you say, who will you tell the story to? Inevitably it's, my mom, my sister, my family back in, and they named their country. Whoa. And the gospel is going from here to there. Mm-hmm. We actually have a Bible study in Kabul uh, because we're in connection with people here, and that's who they wanted wow. to tell. Wow. And uh, we have 
uh, we, we actually kind of had, and I need to be careful, I won't name the country, but a small revival in a Middle Eastern country because of the gospel went back through family and friends. And we were able to, to then send someone back who speaks the language, mm-hmm. Arabic, uh, and follow up on those family and friends. And so the gospel is definitely ricocheting around the world to our, to our friends. Which is why I would say that even though diaspora in the United States, those workers, yes, they're in the United States, I still consider them cross-cultural workers mm-hmm. because they are crossing cultures uh, every day. But the gospel is definitely moving from here to there. You even see negative examples, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, we've had uh, a Saudi couple come to faith in Christ, a whole family. Uh, and we also then saw uh, the danger that that put them in and their family back in their homeland. Mm-hmm. And so we know that the gospel is moving, uh, that the message is moving because of the positive and the, the negative side of things. Um, let me just say one other thing, too, uh, regarding uh, that conversation. You know, I think sometimes we feel like you need to find the most spiritual, the most godly, whatever, the most something. And they're the ones who can do diaspora ministry. We just had a 20-year-old girl do an internship with us for four months. Uh, For some crazy reason, she knows how to speak Arabic. But within (laughs) her four months, she had led uh, someone to Christ. uh, And that gospel message from that man is going back to his homeland in the Middle East. And now the team that's there that has more experience, et cetera, et cetera, is involved as well. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just the idea of having eyes that can see Mm -hmm. uh, what's happening just all around you. I think we look through people. uh, We don't see them. uh, But just stopping and seeing them and everyday kindness uh, is is pretty amazing. Mm. And then watching uh, you know, it's not by my might, not by my power, but by the Spirit of God. And we just see God take over, and amazing stories are the result. Wow. So let me uh, let me close us with, with this question. My hope is that, uh, you know, people listening to this, if you're an agency leader, if you're a pastor, if you're someone who just, you know, works across the desk uh, from someone who's Muslim and, and gets really excited by these stories and goes, all right, God, um, I feel like at a lot of mission conferences, you know, we hear, oh, here's a here's a movement that happened here, and then like the workers in that area can feel really bummed out because like, well, where's my movement? Like, why why am I not being used in this way? And so I don't want us to replicate this and go like, oh, here's our here's our one best story from 15 years of ministry or something. Um, so imagine you're talking with that you know bright eyed, bushy tailed person that just heard this podcast and is very invigorated by these stories and goes, all right. God's using this for me to take that step with my neighbor, my coworker, or maybe organizationally. All right, we're gonna we're gonna send that team into Atlanta or into Houston or L.A. wherever. Um, what's what would be one piece of advice that you would give them that maybe you wish you knew when you started this? Of uh, just kind of a word of wisdom. What would that be? So I think there's a lot of truisms that get thrown around as authoritative out there. That's mm-hmm. like. Oh, well, this is always the case, and this is always the case. I do want to just say, like, I think it's so important to listen mm-hmm. and to learn and have a spirit of humility that starts everything. Um, uh, abide in Christ is, is the key, right? Like, it's, it's literally the only, the most important thing you can be, do to be fruitful. Like, it's, it's the prerequisite to fruit. Um, otherwise, you turn into a fruit salesman, right? You, you turn into somebody trying to vend your story right. instead of producing disciples and healthy disciples um and so i think just come humble come ready don't anticipate that you're the only one we kind of had this elijah complex sometime where we we say to god well i'm the only one who cares about muslims in my context and and then like the lord is kind of like well look i've got two thousand people you don't even know about that that i'm i'm working in over here um and so just kind of expect to find partners expect to find just Mm -hmm. unbelievable resources within the harvest and i think 
I think the third that I would encourage people to do is just believe in the harvest, like believe in the harvest to be the answer for more of the harvest, mm-hmm. right? That we're trying to unearth the Pauls and the Peters of that context so that they can take that back to their own context, that we're not the heroes. We're, we're Jesus is the hero of this story. Like we're not the heroes of this story, but, but Jesus is, and uh, just inviting him to do more than we could imagine. Cause a lot of times, my best strategies and my best efforts can get in the way uh, more than than help God out, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I would echo the listening part. Really listen to what people are telling you. Uh, another big piece is prayer. Uh, you know, pray before you go, pray while you're there, pray while you're speaking. Just really ask God, uh, you know, even to correct the mistakes that you might be making. Uh, you know, I'd rather see someone go and genuinely build a relationship and really listen and really genuinely care about someone um, because God is capable of fixing those things that we didn't know. Uh, not an excuse to be mindfully wrong, but uh, yeah. but an opportunity to get started. And then, you know, this is going to maybe sound a little strange, but I think so many times we go to rescue somebody as if we are better. Uh, and, you know, the, that old saying, the foot of the cross is even, you know, we're going because God has changed and transformed us. And we want to give that opportunity for Jesus to speak to the people we're going to talk with. They're not, you know, less than, they're not more than, they're people just like we are who just desperately need Jesus. And so go with the love of Christ. Love covers a lot of mistakes, pray, and, and just really listen to them and the, and the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. So, so for me, as regards specifically this idea of these kind of global connections, my, my advice always is we have to value relinquishing control. Uh, in the early days when I started yeah. presenting on this topic and sharing stories, uh, a gentleman took me aside. He goes, you know, this is, this is, this is great. This is what we need but you know what we lose? And I said, no, what? He said, control. And he said, all of our plans are based on projecting power, right? We raise the money. We, we strategize what's the biggest city with the largest group. How do we, you know, what's the best key neighborhood? We send the person there, and it's all just us projecting into there. And I think when we start on this side, often for, for us, uh, you know, Josh, you, we didn't talk about this a lot, but like you mentioned, hey, we had to come back from the field. You know, I'm back from the field. Nate's back from the field. So with all of us, there's kind of this, when we think back, there's probably this, this sadness for us. And so even for ourselves, there's this sense of we didn't have the power that we wanted to have to stay there long term or as long as we wanted, or maybe there's a disappointment with God. And yet if we can embrace giving up control, which also goes back to y'all's idea of listening, now we're listening to God of, all right, why did you bring me back and put me here? You know, you're in control and I know you're good, uh, but what do you want to do? And then not go, okay, and now I'm going to control that. Still go, all right, you're connecting me back to, you know, Obscuristan, somewhere over there. And how do I, how do I just stay yielded in letting you have control and this not having to be a build my church, build my organization, build my school, whatever type uh, experience. So I think, uh, I think that's a key key concept is just understanding God's in control. And when we can follow that, I think you see these amazing stories. And then just patience so and letting good, it happen. Man. That's so good, man. I think leading from that place of surrender was was probably the most unnatural thing, especially the Americans, right? Yeah, it's like brutal. Losing control. It's brutal. Death stinks, right? Like dying to yourself is hard. It really does. It really does. Well, everybody's in that position now, though. I mean, the this the the whole globalization. I mean, I think we're all uh, think it, if we could think in terms of bridge people. You know, everybody's struggling with their identity. How how does how do our friends, how do our diaspora friends express their identity? Even are they from their home country? Are they American? And they they have these this crossover. Um, situation they don't even know how to describe it themselves who they are but but when they can live in both both um both worlds that's where the transitions can happen josh and susan and nate thank you so much for joining us today 
been a pleasure. Thank you, guys. You've been listening to the Medina Podcast. This show is hosted by Brian Hebert and produced by Nate Schultz. The conversations we have on this program are born out of an expanding environment of collaboration among grassroots ministry practitioners across the North American continent. Click subscribe in your favorite podcast app and take a moment to help us get the word out to others by sharing this program freely. If you would like to engage on a deeper level, please email us at medinafocus at vision59.